with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus said to the chief priests and the elders of the people, What is your opinion? A man had two sons. He came to the first and said, Son, go out and work in the vineyard today. He said in reply, I will not. But afterwards he changed his mind and went. The man came to the other son and gave the same order. He said in reply, yes, sir, but did not go. Which of the two, <clears throat> which of the two did his father's will? They answered, the first. Jesus said to them, amen, I say to you, tax collectors and prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God before you. When John came to you in the way of righteousness, you did not believe him, but tax collectors and prostitutes did. Yet even when you saw that, you did not later change your minds and believe him. My sisters and brothers, the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Seven thirty, nine thirty, eleven forty-five. I was told that the eleven forty-five is not eleven thirty, so I can preach fifteen minutes longer at this mass. I'll stop when I see you yawn, okay? Yeah. The readings today begin with the Israelites being reminded that God's ways are not our ways. And then in the second reading today, we get a selection of the oldest Christian hymn that we have in Philippians 2. Paul borrowed this from a Christian community singing and praising the fact that God empties himself to become like us. And then the gospel can be read, I think, on one of two levels. On the macro level, it's directed toward the Jewish people. Look, you were the firstborn. You were the ones to whom we offered this covenant. And you said, sure, Yahweh, I'll go with you wherever you want me to. I'll follow however you reveal yourself. But then they refuse to listen to the Christ. Where the Gentiles, the tax collectors, the prostitutes, the great sinners, at first blush, they may seem that they say no. We don't want anything to do with you, but then they realize they need a savior, and so they end up following Christ into that vineyard. This is the great paradox I want us to think about today, that God's ways are not our ways. And more particularly, God's ways are not our ways in the ways of love, in the ways of acceptance. This is the great paradox, that in weakness, Christ works his greatest power. Ever notice how we begin liturgy? By confessing our sins. By telling God that we have goofed up this week. Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy. This isn't something antecedent to worship, it's the beginning of worship, by saying, Lord, I need a savior. I can't do this on my own. Alone I am cold and hard and insecure and jealous, but in you I begin to warm up and love and accept. God's ways are not our ways, because I imagine most of us still have those old tapes from childhood. Those old tapes say something like this, when I'm good, I'm rewarded. Right, kids? When you do your chores, you get your allowance, right? And when I'm bad, I either get spanked or put in time out, depending on what decade you grew up in. But that's the way the world works, that when I'm successful, I'm accepted, and when I am lacking, I am rejected. But notice what rejection means in God's kingdom. It actually leads to new life. This is the great paradox of admitting that we are sinners and that we need a savior. Where that is admitted, we usually become a little more tender, a little more vulnerable, a little more accepting. How many of you have ever said this in your life? Hey, would you pray for me, please? I'm having, I'm having a really, really good day. Doesn't usually work that way, right? We usually ask people to pray for us when we're waiting for that medical report, when we're hoping for that relationship to be healed, we're hoping to close that one deal or whatever. But it's in the brokenness that God finds us. And that's why that second reading is so important. That we believe as Christians, the second person of the Trinity emptied himself of divinity, meaning he let go of the glories and the comfort and the security of heaven to live life like us. His ways are not our ways. 
If I had to meet sin, if I had to meet death, if I had to meet Satan, I'd probably come with all guns blazing. Sorry, I read, you're not actually allowed guns in here, I read that in the back there. But don't most of us meet strength with greater strength? Don't most of us meet the anger of our spouse with greater anger? Don't most of us meet rejection by rejecting others? God's ways are not our ways. He met sin and death and the powers of hell by becoming weak. You see, God is gentle and a gentleman. He calibrates, if you will, his greatness to our littleness. Remember Moses in the book of Exodus? He goes up the mountain and he sees God's backside, which is Hebrew for backside. And he's so struck with God's glory, he has to go into self-quarantine. He comes down Mount Sinai and has to go into a tent for a few days because his face is so luminous. If you and I saw God as God is, we would explode. So what does God do? He takes on the form of a, of a baby. <laughs> of an unborn, yeah, thank you. Perfect timing, right? I mean, who in here is scared of a child? Who in here would be afraid to hold that baby in Bethlehem? And notice how gentle he is. He reveals himself slowly over those 33 years, and the night before he dies, he says, look, I am the God who's become body and blood for you. I am the God who's lived this life like you. And so before I ascend back to the Father, I'm going to keep my promise to be with you forever. And now I'm going to translate my greatness into bread and wine. Who can be scared of bread and wine? God's always looking for ways to enter into our lives as one of us, gently, humbly, silently. That's why daily prayer is so important. Taking time to listen to the way God speaks to each of you individually, uniquely to become familiar with how God prompts you, the desires of your heart, the loves of your life, the pictures on your phone, the people you carry about each day. That's how God's trying to get your attention. And God's doing all of this thing, as Paul says, to unite us in one body. The one body that Christ is, we too are extensions of. We oftentimes think that God's presence is the reward for our virtue. We oftentimes think that when I'm good, God rewards me. But you know what? Our virtue is a sign that God is already present. At baptism, you and I received everything we needed to become saints. And here's the paradox. God loves us not because we're always lovable. God loves us because he is love. If your eyes are on you, you're always going to feel unaccepted and unworthy. But if your eyes are on a God who is perfect love, you'll understand that he can have no response to you other than love. Look back at your life story. The things you wanted to work out that didn't, can you see God there? Look back at your life and see how God has directed you into this life today. Granted, it's probably not gone perfectly, but nonetheless, I hope all of us can see that we are here that the people next to us are there because of God's love for us. You know, we Christians are the only ones that call God love. God is love, 1 John 4, 8. It's not in the Old Testament. Love is not one of the 99 names of Allah in Islam. You and I are the only ones that call God love because Christians are the only ones that understand that God is three. St. Augustine said, wherever you see love, you always see a trinity. Wherever there's love, there's always a lover, the beloved, and the love who unites them. And that's ultimately how we begin and end liturgy, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In the name of the lover, the beloved, and the love who unites them. And that is the cause, the sustenance, the goal of our very existence. You and I are here because God loves us. And in allowing God to love us, we become lovable. All the great stories are about this. Beauty and the Beast, The princess and the frog. The beast becomes human, not because he's beautiful, but because he allows the, what's her name, Belle? Emma Watson? He allows her to kiss him, allows her to love him. The prince, or the prince was a frog. He wasn't beautiful, but in allowing himself to be kissed, he becomes beautiful. One of the prayers that you can make every day that's so powerful, that's sometimes so simple that we forget to do it, is say, God, Father, Son, Spirit, lover, beloved, love, I allow you to love me. God will never force himself upon us. But part of us doesn't want to be loved, right? 
Part of us wants to keep our own selves to ourselves because love is risky. Relationship is risky. When we put another at the center of our lives, when we no longer choose to value ourselves only by ourselves but allow others to matter to us, that can be very painful. In fact, it might cost us our lives. But that's the whole point of being a Christian, is admitting that you have been made a child of the Father. You too are the sons and daughters of God. In a few seconds, we're going to say the creed. Do you ever notice those words in the creed, begotten, not made? There's two ways of being a child of the Father. There's one son who's begotten. He is God from God, light from light, true God from true God, of the same substance, consubstantial. But one son wasn't enough for the Father. He wanted billions of sons and daughters, and so through grace, he makes us so. Notice that. Who can call God Father but a child? By extension, who can call Mary mother except her children? And you and I have been brought into the same family as Jesus Christ. The Father loves him just as much as he loves you. That's not heresy, by the way. The difference is that Jesus Christ allows himself to be loved 100%. You and I, on a good day, I don't know, I think I'm up to about 4%. Right? Love has to be received freely. And that's what grace should ultimately do. It's not about keeping the rules. It's not about following your Sunday obligation. It's not about putting something in the basket. It's about being transformed into a beloved child, so confident of God's love that you bring it to the world. And that's really where the new evangelization starts. It used to be repent, the end is near. Don't worry, the end of this homily is almost near. But I think today what people listen to is not so much repent, because they don't think they have anything to repent of. I think what moves people's hearts today is, look, you were loved. And when we can receive love, the self-hurt, the self-abuse, the self-loathing, all the things that mark our 21st century start to cease because love softens the heart. It allows us to know our dignity truly and worthily. About 30 years ago, people at Steubenville, Franciscan University, realized that the Catholic Church was bleeding of young people. People were leaving. In fact, today, the statistic is 80% of people who leave the Catholic Church will do so between the ages of 18 and 23. I'm the aide of eight children. Only two of us still go to Mass. You know that's bad when one of those is the Jesuit, right? But it all happened between 18 and 23. So the Fellowship of Catholic University Students is an organization that trains recent college graduates in apologetics, in scripture, in spirituality, in prayer. And we have about four months in the summer with these kids, and then we send them out into usually larger state schools. And those kids are trained, if you will, to start Bible studies, to reach out to the Catholic kids who have lapsed, to invite other people to look at Christianity and Catholicism. And it's pretty robust Catholicism, undiluted. And we have been very, I think, successful through the Lord's grace. We're over 150 campuses now. We have a group, you say ooey pooey here? right? Um, And we go where we're not usually represented. So I know like Bloomington has the Dominicans, they're doing a great job, so we wouldn't go there, but we're going to larger schools where there isn't a Catholic presence. But now that we've been so successful at campuses, we've been trying to go into parishes. And I'm here today just to let you know on those brochures that you have on your seats or in the pews, that if you have a prayer request, especially if someone who's left the church, our missionaries... 800 some now, make a holy hour every day. That's part of their contract. And so they will pray for you, I promise. Obviously, too, if you want to know more, you can put your name and email and address. And thirdly, we're asking if you have any maybe inspiration to help donate. Your money will go toward summer training, it will go toward travels, and it will go toward helping buy books and Bibles for kids on campuses. I'm sure a lot of it goes toward pizza, too. You give pizza, people come, right? But it's that kind of thing. So I'll end here with one last kind of takeaway point for you. The Lord Jesus today uses the example of a vineyard. And let's face it. At some point in our lives, all of us have said, no, I'm not going to go. But maybe today the Lord has put something on your heart, inviting you to ask yourself this question this week. Where in my life am I feeling called to step out a little bit more? Who in my life have I know I've been putting off, I haven't been that charitable charitable toward, I haven't been that present to? And maybe the Lord's asking me to go into that part of the vineyard of my life. 
Maybe I've stayed away from daily prayer commitments. Maybe I've stayed away from confession. Maybe I've stayed away from seeing where there's a holy hour available. But maybe the Lord has put something into your heart this morning that says, you know what, you've been saying no, but I'm giving you the grace to step out a little bit more. Where in your life, who in your life, could we be more Christ to? So I invite you now to take a look at those brochures. I'm going to say a couple Hail Marys, and we'll have baskets in the back of Mass to put those into as we leave in an hour and a half.